What's going on, everybody? Ears up in depth. Man, is it a news day or what, Jeremy? It is, um, you know, when they say it rains, it pours, uh, and it's pouring. It's monsoon season right now. We have a lot to cover. I have a lot to talk about specifically. I have too much to talk about, and um, I'm a little honestly nervous about how this show is going to go. I'm just going to be honest with you right now. Why? I don't know, because it's like we do our, you know, fair share of, um, of like, uh, you know, opinion stuff and whatever. Um, but today's show is like base at least on my side is like all opinions and stuff like that. And it's not, um, I don't know. I just, I let other people online get in my head and I don't, you're never to. short on opinions. I've noticed. I know. And I don't know if that's good or not. We still haven't been bought out by Spotify. So, you know, who can say if it's a, a, a good tact or not. Well, we have breaking news to discuss and I'm sure you're going to get into it. That happened just this afternoon. Yes, thought, have- my God, I can't believe we're recording in depth this evening. I know. Can you imagine your luck? Yeah. <laughs> it's just your luck, man, to be recording this evening with me. Right. Yeah. Breaking news or not. Breaking news. Yeah. Um, all right, Jeremy. Well, how many stories do you have? This is one thing we always say we're going to get through. And we never do. Uh, I have two. Okay, they're, I have two. They're, they're massive. So, oh, I mean, I have two. Then I'll keep it to two. I had a, I had a third backup that I didn't even really write up. I was just going to discuss it, but we'll take that off the plate. It's not critical. Maybe okay. It's not mission critical for this evening. Well, I'm. So, I sort of want to just open with the breaking news because the thing that I have, the big story that I have, it's not necessarily Disney parks focused. Uh, It's very Disney adjacent, like you wave a a Disney term over the article and suddenly it's, you know, relevant. Um, So we can close out with that one. Mine will be the last story. How about that? All right. This one. So let's jump right into it, Jeremy. I'm sure you're aware it's been hitting all the mainstream Disney blog spheres that Bob Iger, CEO of the Walt Disney Company, has been forcibly extended (laughs) in his role as CEO. The board unanimously decided, I think just today, at least it was announced today, that Bob Iger is the best move to continue running the Disney company until 2026. And of course, he had no choice but to accept their uh, their decision. This is from the WaltDisneyCompany.com. It says... Uh, The Walt Disney Company Board of Directors announced today that Robert A. Iger has agreed to continue to serve as Chief Executive Officer through December 31st, 2026. In voting unanimously to extend Iger's contract by two years, the independent members of the Board of Directors noted that Iger's extension provides continuity of leadership during the company's ongoing transformation and allows more time to execute a transition plan for CEO succession, which remains a priority for the board. So basically, they just rolled out the same PR statement as when they, they booted JPEG, it seems like. This is like nothing how many, changed. How many extensions has this guy had? I mean, this, if we go I back think, to before he retired. And I think this back. is the fourth. I think it's the fourth. Tiresome. Yeah, if you if you don't count the, I'm gonna stay on while Bob Chapek is here. I think this is like the fourth. If you count that one, I think it's the fifth. No, <laughs> well, that's right. He did do that while he. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's always got a reason. Always, stay. always, he is he is the hero in his own story. Quote: Time and again, Bob has yeah, shown true. time <laughs> and again, again and again <laughs> and again. Time in memoriam. Uh, Bob has shown an unparalleled ability to successfully transform Disney to drive future growth and financial returns, earning him a reputation as one of the world's best CEOs, said Mark Parker, chairman of the Walt Disney Company. Bob has once again set Disney on the right strategic path for ongoing value creation and to ensure the successful completion of this transformation while also allowing ample time to position a new CEO for long-term success. The board determined it's in the best interest of the shareholders to extend his tenure, and he has agreed to our request to remain chief executive officer through the end of 2026. 
few things I want to say about the the vocabulary in here. It's it's very stock forward, very profit forward, and it I don't really feel like it's a, like anybody cares. You know, I guess what I'm trying to say. I, I don't like the way that Disney just comes right out and says, look, we're just at, we're just chasing profits. There's nothing about like bringing new stories to the park or connecting with guests or making parks this or making movie experiences that it's very much whatever's best for the bottom line. We are going to do no matter what. So it's within the best interest of the stockholders that we go ahead and keep this dustbin around. <laughs> dustbin. Well, and if they were a true creative company, those things that you mentioned, additions to the park, creative new stories, those would be the impetus for profit. But they Correct. can't rely on that because they haven't, you know, movies have notoriously been not profitable for the last year or so as we've yeah. talked and about. And re remind me, who in the last year has been the CEO? I forget. <laughs> I forget. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's right. The man that they're extending. Yeah. And, the, and his predecessor was picked by who? The guy that they're extending. <laughs> right. The thing is, they're asking him to do a job that he's already failed at horribly one time before. He's proven that he is terrible at succession management. And one right. of the things that's a key, I, I was looking this up this afternoon, and I was on uh, Forbes.com, and it says that one of the key uh, elements of being a good leader is people who train their replacement, who are always building a bench, who are always making sure that there is a backup contingency succession plan, because it's not just about you, it's about setting up the company for the future. He is uniquely unqualified and manifestly <laughs> unable to do this. And the one time that he did do it, he failed miserably and gave us gave us Bob Chapek. And then when you look back at all the talent that has departed the company on his watch, namely Tom Staggs, who was brilliantly positioned to take over the company, was beloved by the, uh, by the cast. He's he left because he saw the writing on the wall, and instead we gave it to Chapek. This guy is unable. I think he's so blinded by his own vision of his own abilities that he's completely incapable of spotting and developing other talent. I mean, yes, I guess if you if you consider Chapek a failure, then yes. I don't think Chapek was given the right chance because Iger, and we've said this before, I've said it before, because Iger still hung around. He was the albatross around Chapek's neck. He never left. And so I think when you have that kind of rift, I should, I guess, in, in upper management and sea level management, where you have the old guy who everyone loved is still here in the corner somewhere. But now you, I don't think it gives a lot of credence to the power of the new guy. And so I think automatically people are going to poo-poo what the new guy is doing. He took the company in a different direction. What he thought was profitable, what he thought uh, you know, would lead to the best interest of the shareholders, but I thought was never given the opportunity to really fully bear those out before he was destroyed by McCarthy, who then since left. There's a McCarthy-shaped dust cloud in the C-suite area, and uh, Bob is there, you know, Iger's there going, well, well, now I have to fix the thing that I sort of created. Yeah, I don't know. He, so far, Iger hasn't really done anything, hasn't shown me that he's better than JPEG. In fact, he's worse because he fired 7,000 people. Yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah. Well, I... I do agree with you that he was set up for failure, but you are Thank at you. the you are allegedly at the CEO level. After at a certain point, you if you're able to command uh, what is Disney's over a hundred billion dollar company in revenue, I think it or maybe it's eighty billion. It's it's a obviously a large company global. If you're in position to deal with that, like no matter what traps were set, you, you have to be able to figure that out. And he didn't yes. do himself. I don't think as as many as much as he inherited and his problems he had, I don't think he did anything to help himself. Correct. I agree. That he was is not a good you know, communicator. Consider there's a class action lawsuit against Disney right now about misrepresenting Disney Plus's performance. And by the way, that lawsuit coincides with Christine McCarthy's departure, who was the CFO. So there's a whole thing around that. But that all happened on Bob Chapek's watch, the right. misrepresenting. Now, it doesn't necessarily – it's a lawsuit. It's an, it's an allegation. It doesn't mean that it's true that they did that. But that's what people are claiming, and that's why there's a class action lawsuit, which I believe as of 
yesterday was allowed to even proceed to whatever its next step is. Oh man. So he was he set up to fail? Yes, but he didn't do himself any favors while there either. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. This is from uh, Bob Iger. He says, quote, since my return to Disney just seven months ago, I've examined virtually every facet of our business to fully understand the tremendous opportunities before us, as well as the challenges we've been facing from the broader economic environment and the tectonic shifts in our industry. On my first day back, we began making important and sometimes difficult decisions to address some existing structural and efficiency issues. And despite the challenges, I believe Disney's long-term future is incredibly bright. Well, of course you're going to say that, Bob. What do you what do you want this? What do you want to say? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I've peeked in every cupboard, and uh, man, I'll be damned. But uh, this company's tanking, so uh, the future is not very bright at Disney, guys. Just so you know. Uh, anyway, but there's more to accomplish before this transformative work is complete. God, he is so full of himself. And because I want to ensure Disney is strongly positioned when my successor takes the helm, I have agreed. So I want to set up the next guy for, for success instead of the failure that I left the other guy with. Um, I have agreed to the board's request to remain CEO for an additional two years. The importance of the succession process cannot be overstated as the board continues to evaluate a highly qualified slate of internal and external candidates I remain intensely focused on a successful transition. He acts like he had no idea this was coming. He wasn't a part of this negotiation. He he acts like he there was a knock at his door, and the board was there, and they were like, "A raven was, some, was, was sent." Yeah, a raven was stay. sent to the boardroom. And he's yeah. like, what? This, what is this? Or I'm being I sent was, ravens. I was asked by the board. This they came to this agreement. He first of all, every not only every financial analyst, every podcaster has been calling this for weeks and months. I mean, <laughs> everyone knew he was going to extend because also when he was brought back, there were two reasons for his there were he had a remit, two things: write the ship and find a successor. Yep. And we're sitting here more than a year later, and everyone's kind of saying to themselves, not hearing much about this successor. Yep. To be fair, ship doesn't seem to be right at either, but that's nope. another, that's another fact, problem. It's, it's listing even more to the left now it's, than ever. <laughs> it's it's just, listing uh... to the left. So he's not really doing either of the two things. And their answer is more. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. Disney shares, shares of Disney stock have been trading at about 90 bucks today, down 3% from a year ago. When he took over, I remember uh, Iger took over and it, they were at like 92 bucks, I think is what it is. The other day they were at 88. Like the stocks have not, I mean, they, they popped a little bit, but they've tanked in the last, you know, seven months. Um, and 54% down from their peak in March 2021. Following the news of Mr. Iger's extension, dig this, shares remained largely flat in after hours trading. <laughs> well, of course. Well, so, so they made this move. And they they said in their in their um, announcement specifically for the benefit of the st- of the shareholders. It's in the, with the shareholders' best interests, right, to keep him on. Mm. Shareholders do not care. Wall Street does not care. In fact, I think that's that would probably be more of a sign that Wall Street is sort of tired of this. They're tired of this man. Something's going on. What's happening? Um, you know, imagine you're you're the self touted savior of the Disney company, not once but twice, and your announcement generates zero stock pop. <laughs> that sucks. Man. Yeah, it was relatively flat. By the way, on the S&P 500, which it trades under, was up today. More, I mean, not it was up 32 points. The NASDAQ was up 158 points. Disney was flat on <laughs> what is supposed to be a good announcement. <laughs> I don't know. The challenge is that in addition to succession, Disney is dealing with problems on almost every front, including new questions about its movie studios, given disappointing results at the summer box office for Elemental, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which is relating to my second story, and to a lesser extent, The Little Mermaid. Disney has been maneuvering to buy full control of Hulu, but such a purchase would be expensive, and Disney is loaded with roughly $45 billion with a B dollars of debt. So good. 35. 45. 45. Yeah. 
So, and but correct me if I'm wrong, Jeremy, or remind me, please, who gave the company that debt? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Bob Iger for buying Fox? <laughs> Iger has since dramatically reorganized the company and cut costs, including some 7,000 employees, all in a bid to make its streaming business profitable and to stabilize a declining linear TV business. He is also searching for a new CFO to succeed Christine McCarthy, who stepped aside last month. The CFO position has long been a job where possible future CEOs are trained. Another worry is negotiating a fair deal with Comcast for its 33% stake in Hulu, which will cost Disney at least $9 billion with a B to retain. And also, by the way, when Edgar came on, he said, no more big purchases, and then immediately went and bought some other company, and then now he's, he's, he's uh, negotiating for a $9 billion price tag to, to, for Hulu. But that's, that's beside the point. Yeah, and there's talk that they're trying to unload Hotstar because that's been a disaster <laughs> it's losing all of its subscribers although i guess because they i suppose i guess i read that they're they stand to balance their books or work towards balancing their books more because they don't have to pay for that cricket license anymore but they've lost a, sh a, a boatload of subscribers <laughs> doing it uh Iger, who previously led disney as ceo from 2005 to 2020 has been set to receive compensation packages valued at roughly 27 million for each of the two years when, of his contract when he first came on his compensation was two million or 27 million dollars each for the two years of his contract however his new contract while similar to the previous one supposedly raises Iger's annual target bonus from 1 million to 5 million dollars making his target annual compensation $31 million a year dependent on performance and share price. Remember a couple paragraphs ago when I mentioned that he fired 7,000 employees mm -hmm. and then now has a compensation package of $31 million a year? I would be livid if I was a, a boots on the ground cast member or anybody below that. Like you're firing 7,000 people in 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 a in a time when people need jobs right but also like th there's there's a lot that's going wrong with the parks we see all the time rides are breaking down websites are going down communication is weird disney social media is bizarre the merch is weird i don't know man there's not enough people at the parks to run the rides efficiently and you know and i understand you're tightening your belt i get it but the problem with this, you know, this sort of thing is whenever there's cuts, there's always going to be someone to take credit for those and they inevitably get a bonus. So he had now has a, he now has more money than, than he ever needed in his entire life, probably deferring most of it to, you know, grow an in interest and then take it. I, mean, I don't know what's going on, but I would be, uh, I am, uh, I'm disgusted. Absolutely disgusted. I don't know. Can yeah. you imagine renegotiating for an extra four mil a year? Like life changing money for 90% of the population. Right. And this man's like, yeah, I just want a little more. It's fine. Well, and if you think about just to add to the list of grievances that you've just posted <laughs> this week, the, their website crashed again. They had, there's people are again? raging on Twitter because they have the ticket sale for the Disneyland Oogie Boogie Bash. Yeah. And uh, I guess they they it, it shut down the first day, and so they had to pause ticket sales because that's what happens. Like right with Run Disney, remember I reported <laughs> on that. They 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 the, the website this Go dot com website they love so much. You know they're so good at technology, uh, and, and apparently like so a lot of people uh, missed out on getting these tickets because then it was back up and then it sold out and it couldn't handle the traffic. So you know. Add that to your list, <laughs> you know, it's but don't worry, me. they're going to be on the, this is the company that's going to be on the Apple vision goggles on day one. I'm sure that's <laughs> going to work out. They can't even make an app. It's very weird to me. You know, I was, I was on, uh, I was on the Google play store, uh, loading an app for Taryn the other day, uh, last night. And I saw that the Disneyland parks, uh, app is rated like 4.4 .4 stars. And I'm like, that is low. And she's like, I thought that's pretty high. I'm like, wait. Isn't it out of five? Yeah. That's but good. 
I don't think it's very good, not for an app run by Disney. When you had the McDonald's app had 4.6 stars. Like, I, I think if you're... <laughs> if you're a, McDonald's it, have an app? You can order food and play games oh. and stuff. But I think if you're a billion-dollar company and you have an app and it is not 4.8 stars or higher, you are doing something wrong. And I just think that speaks a lot to the, like you're saying, the technology problems that they have translate all, all over. It's not even just the website. It's also the app, too. The app has famously been bloated and kind of weird, and now it's uh, apparently even weirder. And I just think it's very funny that Disney's getting, you know what I mean? Like, it, I, I would never download an app that has less than four and a half stars. And even then, I'd be like, I don't know. This can't, this can't be great. Well, I suppose your rankings are correct because I would have, knowing how bad that app is, I really would have thought it had like two and a half. <laughs> so yeah. okay. I guess if you're That's saying fair. that below four and a half isn't even download worthy, then I guess it does For me, make sense. Yeah, well, and, and also, you know, it, I wonder if you can take some of the Disney uh, shine off of it where a lot of Disney fans instantly love anything that Disneyland's attached to. So they are probably putting their memories on the app and going, oh man, this was really good. I'm going to rate it because I had such a great time using the app even though it stunk and it was low and it crashed and it whatever, and it sucked my battery and it was hard to <laughs> refresh the screen. And, you know, it's those kinds of things, right? We sort of like gloss over a lot of the negative stuff. Yeah. Um, Disney, it, it, their brand is sort of like that. You know what I mean? It's sort of a, a cloaking device over bad, over bad things because you're, you have such an attachment to the, to the park, to the brand, right? Except us, I guess. Well, Amanda in the chat, is uh -oh. weighing in. She says, I, was I love when Amanda's in, by the way. Amanda has got a lot of insights, and she's saying, I was a customer service rep for Walt Disney World, and all of our cast member portals had to be run on Explorer. <laughs> 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 I'm sure I'm surprised it wasn't Netscape. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't, they couldn't actually answer the phone because it would kick them off the computer. <laughs> kick them off the internet. <laughs> Don't pick it up. <laughs> um, I'm downloading something. <laughs> Speaking of something to download, Jeremy, summer is here, and our friends at the 21st Amendment are celebrating the return of the warmer days with their popular and everyone's favorite seasonal beer, Hell or High Watermelon Wheat. It, we are going to be cooking here underneath a heat dome this next week, and I need to get some Hell or High Watermelon to cool down. Um, oh, it's I, great. I didn't know what you – I thought you were going to tell me about a recipe, but you are physically cooking the heat dome. because of the heat. <laughs> Yeah. I was like, oh, what are well, you that's making? what it's called. It's called a heat dome. We're making Jason soup, I guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, the brewers at the twenty. You, is that just you in the hot tub? Yeah, basically, yeah. Jason soup. <laughs> <laughs> I just spin around. Taryn comes in and throws parsley on me. <laughs> uh, the brewers at the Twenty First Amendment brew an American wheat beer with real watermelon juice, creating a refreshing, fruity, and quenching beer, or what they affectionately call summer in a can. Hello, how watermelon wheat will make any weekend barbecue or beach time activity that much better. When visiting the California Bay Area, be sure and stop in at the 21st Amendment's San Francisco Brew Pub at 563 2nd Street in um, San Francisco, just two blocks from where baseball is played. That's Giant Stadium, by the way. And also be sure and visit their brewery tap room just across the bay in San Leandro with an outdoor beer garden. I will say just real fast on the beer front, and then uh, we'll go to your story and take a break. Um, Anchor Steam, you ever heard of that brand? Anchor no. Steam beer there in San Francisco. Well, big breaking news in the beer world, in case anybody cares. Anchor Steam is being closed down. They okay. have been a beer company for 127 years. Oh, that's a long time. Pre-prohibition, they were, I think, the first, possibly second brewery in San Francisco ever. Um, they survived prohibition. They survived World War One, World War Two, obviously. Been running consistently. They sold to Sapporo, actually, in 2017. Sapporo had no idea what to do with them, ran them into the ground, oh, and uh, they announced today, this morning, that they are closing uh, closing down. And it's a real bummer, because if you're a beer fan and going on the tour of Anchor Steam, it's in this old building, and it's like hardwood floors, these giant copper kettles, and it just you, it's one of those places, man, where like, you go in and you feel the history immediately. It's yeah. everywhere. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's a real bummer. It's a real bummer. I'm not, I promise I'm not getting emotional. I just, uh, my voice is cracking. Yeah. So anyway, there you go. All right. Rest in peace to Anchor Steam Brewing. Uh, great people. And, uh, you know, uh, 
true purveyors of craft beer in general. So if you enjoy craft beer now, uh, it's it's mainly you know praise to Fritz Maytag from the Maytag family, by the way, to um, you know revise it and revitalize it in the '60s. I think is when he bought it. Well, it's a shame 21A couldn't come along and buy them out from Sapporo. I, I was Wouldn't texting nice. Sully. I was like, dude, that's why you were brewing with uh, with your buddy the other day. You, I know you guys bought. You guys tell me you bought Ankerstein. He didn't buy Ankerstein. Ah. All right, Well, Jeremy. that's a shame. Yeah, this man, already this episode is full of bummers. <laughs> yeah. Mainly you and me. All right, what do you got? He might be staying at the company started by a mouse so he can continue to renovate his enormous house. <laughs> God, I'm so glad you're talking about this. Bob Iger is in the midst of not only a contract extension, but a massive renovation of his $33 million mansion as the company finishes off another wave of layoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is timed so perfectly with these people. It's so unseemly. Like, they do, like he just does it. Maybe just put it off a little longer there, Bob. The New York Post reporting that Disney CEO Bob Iger's sprawling Los Angeles estate has been has seen already about $7 million in changes and renovations, according to their estimates. So really, his contract, what did he, he raise it for? $4 million, did you say in your story? That's not even enough to cover his renovations. It, per year, yeah. We, a poor thing. The seven-bedroom, nine-bathroom mansion is worth an estimated $33 million and was purchased by Iger back in 1995. Development records show the renovation. This is great because you have to submit uh, you know, get permits for all sorts, all of this work. So we have access to all of it, right? <laughs> so development records show the renovations include a replastering of the swimming pool, the addition of a spa, removal of an old stable, uh, a single story stable, the construction of a new two story stable building <laughs> in its place. Well, single story. <laughs> right. And also, know. who has horses on the second floor? You're right. Well, that's where the hay Backing goes. them up like it's Hollywood Squares. Uh, <laughs> Also added were a one-story attached living quarter and a new set of stairs that runs in the back of the home, as well as new gates and a new two-story media room with storage. In addition, the property received a detached covered patio, along with expansions of the first and second floors to include a large terrace that spans an additional 940 square feet, which is 100 square feet bigger than my apartment. <laughs> um, <laughs> Disney previously had three Rounds of layoffs ordered by Iger with the goal of eliminating 7,000 jobs. The end. <laughs> I did read a little bit about that. I guess, I mean, he bought his house years ago and it's grown in value and that's cool for him, I guess. But yeah, it's just, it seems, it's very like, um, I, yeah, I, I don't know how to, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess it happens and he's not thinking about how this looks or whatever. And maybe he shouldn't, I don't know. But it doesn't it doesn't look good. I tell you that it does not he, look awesome. He may not have to worry about how it looks, I suppose. Um, maybe it's none of our business, but it's out there and it's public record. And it may not be what Disney marketing wants out there, but it's out there. And as CEO, you should know that that could get out there and you should consider that. Yeah, uh, what, I, I, I don't feel bad that this is out there for him. No, I don't feel bad. No, I don't feel bad. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, I don't feel bad for anybody who uh, has oh, more money than me. <laughs> Basically, you know what just, I mean. It is just it's a it's a bit of a bad luck. Like I'm sure the house was probably because also the or what I one thing I didn't mention that I read in the article is that he has spent years improving the house. Like it's not like he yeah. ha, he's it's not like this house is stuck in 1995 and he was like I finally got to update this. He's put millions of dollars in it from 1995 to now according to this article so um, it's it, it, you know he, he he could have been okay for another year like could have, you could have waited year. yeah well i don't know he needs his two-story stable and media room yeah the, hor the horses who live on the upper floors of the stable <laughs> have no place to stay they needed a bigger tv does it does it have horses a horse need elevator? a bigger tv <laughs> Uh, let's take a break, Jer. Oh, we're we're going to take a break real fast. We're going to come right back and uh, and uh, I'll make Jeremy do another story and then I'll have my story wrap up. Well, you've really got the story built up. I do. It's <laughs> Look, we'll come back. Don't worry about it. Hang on, everyone. It's Ears Up in Depth. We'll be right back. 
Back to the newsroom on In Depth. All right, everybody. All right, Jer, let's hit it with your second story, buddy. Actually, I have a little tidbit uh, that just I just remembered. I was talking about Tom Staggs in my first story about how I think he would have been the perfect successor to Bob Iger. And isn't it so funny? My friend was out to dinner last night and ran into Tom Staggs no. in the restaurant and talked to him. Really? Yep. Book him on the show. <laughs> Not Tom, your friend. I want to know what that was. <laughs> But she she just said, like, hey, we really miss you at Disney. Like, and she's like, like, I work there. <laughs> but I guess he said he said he misses it over there. And he uh, recommended Adventures by Disney. And he said he recommended the Disney cruise. And he said he wasn't a cruise person until he took a Disney cruise. And he said it changed his mind. So, wow. He's still touting the brand. Well, good for him. Despite his departure and lack of promotion. You have to Let's, because you, you never know when you're going to come back. That place is a revolving door. You got to leave on the right yeah. terms yeah. from a company like that. You absolutely have to. I'd like him to come back. It seems Disney's chickens are coming home to roost because crowd levels could use a boost. <laughs> good. I popped down to Disney World for July 4th weekend. Uh, but I have to say, I was quite surprised myself. And this is before reading some of these articles that have been published. I walked in. I went to Magic Kingdom on July 3rd. And I'm walking up to the park. And, you know, usually you wait behind at least one or two people to go to the go to the turnstile. <laughs> yeah. And it, I didn't have to. It was just, just walk up. Walk up. up on July really? 3rd. I mean. Huh, that seems like a lot. Yeah. Historically, July 4th weekend is second only to Christmas to New Year's. It's like it's like Christmas mm. to New Year's, Easter, July 4th, and Thanksgiving. Those are like the times that you usually can't get in. They used to have phased closures, obviously, before the park reservation system. So I'm walking up, and I'm thinking, hmm, this is strange. It is July 3rd. So then I walk through the gate, or I walk through the tunnel. It's about 3.30, so the parade's going on. I'm not three deep. I'm not too deep. I walk up to the curb and have a front row spot to watch the three o'clock parade in the Magic Kingdom on July 3rd. Wow. So I'm scratching my head. I was really happy because I brought my camera to take some pictures, but I was also shocked that I could walk up and get a spot on the curb for the parade. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is unheard of. Absolutely. Also considering that on, so the fireworks schedule for July 3rd and 4th is Magic Kingdom does their special July 4th fireworks on both July 3rd and July 4th. Okay. Epcot's fire, July 4th fireworks are only on July 4th. So given that there is only a choice to see Magic Kingdom's two days, I expected that crowds at Magic Kingdom would be high on the third for people who want to go see those fireworks. And then they'd all go over to Epcot because the fourth was only that's their only time to see it. So that's just one more reason why I was a little surprised that yeah. Magic Kingdom wasn't packing in a few more people on the third, given that that was the alternative option to see their fourth of July fireworks. That makes sense. Next day, July 4th, I go over to Epcot to watch those. I've never seen their fireworks. While there were more people than usual, yes, there were way less than I expected for the 4th of July, and actually less than I've seen on an average Saturday in the fall during the Food and Wine Festival when crowds are typically high. So it was quite, I mean, I walked in, the, the Spaceship Earth wait was 20 minutes, or no, sorry, it was 15 minutes. It's the park's marquee attraction. Now, it doesn't always have the biggest crowd, but it's not uncommon on a normal day for me to see that attraction at 30 to 40 minutes. I mean, and when Taryn and I were there in 2015, I guess, or whatever it was, um, in September, that thing had a 15-minute wait, but that was high-ish, you know, um, 5 to 10, and then it went up to 15, 25 a little bit. So... And that's September when nothing is really going on. I would definitely expect uh, on the 4th of July weekend for that to have a bit of a bump. Absolutely. I would think. And then so then you have these posted wait times, which is one thing, you know, OK, it's a 20 minute wait. I'm in Magic Kingdom the other day. Uh, 
uh, Pirates of the Caribbean has a posted 50 minute wait. Okay, 50 minute wait the week of July 4th. That seems normal. It was, but but we get in the line and we're we're on in twenty minutes. So the the, hmm. the posted wait isn't even relating to what the actual <laughs> wait time is. So even even posted waits are inflated, and the posted waits are low. So this is there's definitely hmm. something happening here. Well, I'm not the only one to have taken notice. A website called Thrill Data that tracks park wait times posted on Twitter a graph that showed average waits across Walt Disney World on July 3rd and 4th this year were the lowest observed in 10 years. Oh, man. I wonder why. Do you know why? Are they talking why? So. Are you going to get into it? I will I will get into it. Let me just give you a little bit more info. We'll talk about maybe some of the speculation out there. All right. I then, so this Thrill Data is a great site because you can go on and pull your own graphs. You can say, this is the park I want to compare to this. This is the year I want to compare to this. So I oh, went nice. on and compared that to, un I pulled Universal's performance. So I pulled Universal's performance for this July 4th and compared it to 2019. And then I pulled Magic Kingdom's performance for this year and compared it to 2019 on the 4th. Average wait times at Universal until 4 p.m. on July 4th were relatively flat to where they were on the same day in 2019. To be fair, after 4 p.m., they did drop off from 2019 on average about 30% in the evening. Hmm. Magic Kingdom's average wait times ran anywhere from 35 to more than 50% lower than the same day in 2019 the entire day. There was Oof. no point in the day where they were even close to what they were. So people are saying, oh, Universal's is off. Magic Kingdom's are off substantially, significantly more than the drops that Universal is seeing. And I would also say that Universal probably suffers if Disney suffers. Yes. I, yeah, I think that's a general rule for sure. Yeah. If people aren't booking trips to Florida, that's going because there's a lot of people yeah. who go and then they're like, well, we're going to do a day at Universal. That's yeah, that's what we did. Typical. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you got to do it. Honestly, there's a lot to see over there. Not only that, people were tweeting about Rise of the Resistance. This was crazy. People are screenshotting the wait times from Hollywood Studios showing Rise of the Resistance. I believe it was July 3rd. Maybe it was July 2nd with a 20 minute standby wait what it wow <laughs> dude see i would wait that then i would go in that on that ride yes of course that's when i would go on it too yeah and the thing is it's not a moment in time that was consistent and there were other rides in the park that actually had 30 minute waits it wasn't even the longest ride in the park that day that's the big one that's the attraction that's yeah the one that's everybody, the thing the boarding groups remember people were going over there at 7 a.m yep. uh, what is go so this is i i don't know that you know there's a lot of data points here both, uh, you know, people observing low, uh, observing crowds, my anecdotes, plus actual data from some of these websites. There's another website I saw reference because there's a Wall Street Journal article that actually covered this. And they didn't reference thrill data. They referenced a website called Touring Plans, which does a similar mm -hmm. thing in crowd projecting. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Touring Plans was talking about very similar park performance. So this isn't just, a, you know, a, you know, a few people making hay out of nothing. Um, cause there's people who are on, you know, defending it saying, um, oh, you, they took a picture of magic kingdom at the wrong time of day. And they're saying it was, you know, that's, I don't think that there's deceptive marketing going on here. I mean, these are, this sure. is data, right? Uh, Disney does seem to be reacting, albeit slowly while the two lower tiers of annual pass remain black, blacked out on July 4th. Unless, of course, they open them up way late in the day after I last checked. But I checked throughout the day to see if they were going to finally like because the only hmm. annual passes that were that had access and weren't blocked out on July 4th were the two top tier. So I said, ah, let me check the availability. And I checked probably up until about four or five o'clock and the lower two tiers were still blocked out. So I'm assuming that they never opened them up. Right. Um, Disney has announced. The return of bounce back offers. This is a big one. Starting this week, actually, I think it's starting July 5th. Guests staying at a Disney resort hotel will be receiving communication about a future stay offer. This was a thing for a long time, but was removed in recent years. 
guests will be saving or can save tw between 25 and 35 percent on a future resort stay on selected dates throughout 2024. This is the thing Disney did. They they wanted you to book your next trip before you left. So they give current guests an offer. They took that away. Right. right OK. I think this addresses an issue that I've spoken to several times here, and that is that I think people have been traveling to Disney since the pandemic, seeing the levels of revenge, revenge travel crowding, paying more, getting less, walking away, saying, let's take a break from this for a while. I mean, I read tweets mm -hmm. from people who were like, we used to go every year. We're done for a while. Like, it's a mess down there. Epcot's been under construction now into its fifth year they're not charging <laughs> less because of it the results we've seen so far have been lackluster at best for what they're even coming out with i just think people and they weren't people aren't rebooking so now i think that's this is a very pointed disney reaction to start offering these bounce back offers yeah absolutely because there was a time when it would be unheard of for disney to give you anything <laughs> you get nothing for free you get no they will not make it easy for you to um to come to the park they will not make it easy for you to save money or to rebook or whatever you have to jump through hoops you got to stand in line you got to get a resi you got to do this you can't do that it's a ball of blackout whatever right all that stuff so whenever they release that a little bit they they loosen the choke hold a little bit they pull back on the choker the choke chain um that's around your wallet yeah, yeah, you know they're in trouble for sure. And which is funny because they just eliminated 7,000 jobs, saved five and a half billion dollars on paper, at least anyways, giving a little bit more off the top to Iger, of course. And, um, you know, now suddenly they're concerned that people aren't coming into the parks where I think maybe, I don't know, when people were getting fired, they were flush. With, I, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Never mind. Forget I said it. But yeah, weird. That's well, I've been weird, predicting yeah. this for and i think you could go back and you check have. the archives of this show i have been predicting consistently on this show that this was going to happen that eventually they were going to burn through and churn through people who were yeah. sick of it and going and getting paying more getting less they haven't even brought trams back to all the parks yet you cannot still be blaming covid for this and i've been saying it's gonna happen and now i Revenge travel's happening. Plus, you have, you know, people are now traveling to Europe more than ever. I saw a tweet yesterday from some sky tracker that like there were more airplanes in the sky yesterday than ever in the history of the planet. Jeez, so dear. people are traveling all over the globe again. And it's like, I'm not going back to Disney. There's other places I can see where I'm not going to get nickel and dime. You can go to Europe and get a better deal. You don't have to see fake French. You can go see the real one. Right. So well, I, I think, think I think that's a good point. And, and that's when I've been making the show forever now where it's, I don't want to be, that's why we didn't get uh, annual passes even before they, you know, took them away because I want to go to other places. Uh, there's other stuff to see. It's not uh, Disneyland is cool. I love it. The history is what I love the most about it. It's the best it, it, sort of entertainment time capsule for history and uh, innovation and marketing and, and just family fun and whatever. Right. It's really cool. There's nothing else like it, but there's also other stuff in the world to see. Don't spend every vacation there. You don't need to do it. And I think you you hit on a good point. It's you can go other places and not get nickeled and dimed. And that's the big deal. Every These little price increases that Iger has implemented over the past five, 10 years of slowly raising prices, getting rid of the free coffee refills, getting rid of the free iced tea, just getting rid of the stuff in an effort to save money for the stockholders, the shareholders, the bottom line. I think that contributes in small ways also. Right. Because people eventually go, why am I paying? Now I'm paying 20% more. I'm getting 30% less. And I just don't want to, I don't want to do it. I do think there is, you know, some of that in there as well, for sure. I mean, we're planning on going back in January. I am not looking forward to it because it is expensive. Oh boy. Have I, I not told you this? I think it would happen. No, yeah. you've been saying, no, I'm not doing it. Well, that. Taryn wants to go, and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. So we're, <gasps> we're, we're hashing it out. We're, we'll figure it out. But I don't want to go. I'm not looking forward to it because it is so friggin' expensive. I, 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 when I look at the price tag of stuff, I don't have a good time. <laughs> but mm. I want to buy some of the stuff they have is really cool. And I look at it, and I go, there's no way. I could have, we could have afforded this five years ago. We can't now. Yeah. Well, you know, and I but that's a me problem, right? I'm a little torn because on the one hand, I complain if it's too crowded. 
so I don't want to sound like I'm complaining that there's no crowds. Right. I love, there's not enough I, people here. <laughs> and I did, and I did, yeah. I don't, so I don't want it to come across as that. I am happy that I was, I was perfectly pleased to walk through the park and be like, ah, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is great. I don't like the reason that they're lower, which is that the experience is subpar and people are, I believe, voting with their money in their feet and going elsewhere. And I just hope that Disney learns the right lessons from this. And I think there's glimmers of that, bringing back things like Happily Ever After, things that were really beloved. Uh, but I, I and, and some of these offers and, you know, not charging guest parking anymore who are hotel guests. I think that there's glimmers of that, but I don't know. Uh, it's a tough one to, it's a tough one to report on. Cause I like low crowds, but I want them. I don't know. I don't know what I, how, what do I want? I want low crowds and a great experience. Yeah. No, so I'm not getting, I'm still not getting that, but um, I don't know. This is what seems to be happening. <laughs> you have no choice, man. You know, you have no control over it. Yeah. Uh, all right, Jer. <clears throat> Here's my story, and uh, I don't know. It's it's weird, and um, it's weird. It's weird. You can always I, rely on you for weird. Yeah, well, that's true. This one is is weirder than most. Um, by now you might have heard about the plucky little movie making a dent in the pockets of big entertainment at the box office, most notably taking the lion's share of the Fourth of July movie going public away from Indiana Jones Five. I released on the same day as, uh, as this movie. There's a lot to be said for this event occurring, and normally I would be thrilled by a small distribution house having such a dominant opening weekend for a movie, but there is a fair amount of tarnish on that silver plate that is this movie, Sound of Freedom. And it just so happens to be in the center circle of the Venn diagrams of things I care about, which is Disney, drama, and conspiracy <laughs> theories. Okay. Sound of Freedom is a movie that was uh, released on July 4th. It wrapped up production sometime in 2018. At that time, a distribution deal was already in place with 20th Century Fox, but then Disney came along and purchased the studio, promptly shelving the film indefinitely. Now, right away, I think that should tell you something about the substance of this movie. If Disney doesn't want to make a buck on it, how good is it really? <laughs> you know, There's a full movie done in the can, and they go, nah, that's not going to ever see the light of day. We're not going to release that. That's okay. Yeah, except they have no idea how to make a profitable movie. These it's true. <laughs> true. I think Little Mermaid still hasn't broken even, by the way. <laughs> oh, man. Perhaps someone at Disney dug a little bit into the background of the film subject, like I'm about to do for you, and realized that not all was what it appeared to be. Regardless of why it was shelved, one of the producers crowdfunded enough money to buy out the rights from Disney and Sound of Freedom was finally released on July 4th, 2023. The marketing for it was also crowdfunded, seeing most of that money targeted its intended audience, which was conservative moviegoers with hard leans toward religion. So, you know, I don't want to say the religious right, but because that's sort of um, insightful, but it's, you know, they, they really focused writing or they're focused their marketing on conservative areas with a large crowd of, uh, you know, religious tending, you know, folk. And that's because the man behind the movie and the one portrayed in the film, Tim Ballard, is a Mormon, part of the LDS church, and has been said to have laid out a grand plan way back in 2015 for his personal brand that all leads back to bringing people to his website and ultimately into the LDS church, a sales funnel for the Lord, if you will. Along with the traditional thing like online ad buys, this crowdfunding marketing allowed people to buy tickets in advance for friends and family and other people in general who might not be able to see this movie on opening day for one reason or another. It was this little marketing trick which enabled the film to sell $10 million in advance ticket sales ahead of its opening day. Now, it's not known how many- Wait, of so it's people like people bought it is it like when you go to McDonald's and you buy for the person behind you? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. It's called like, they, they call it like pay it forward. Right. Okay. Where, you know, you can just buy advanced ticket sales, like the Barbie Oppenheimer double double feature. T people already buying tickets for a, a Barbie Oppenheimer double feature. So you can just do that in advance. Got it. 
but the, but they were savvy in how they marketed and they said buy it for somebody who you want to see this who, who might not be able to see this movie because the message and i'll get to that in a second what the movie's about um is so poignant and we need action and they're they're really trying to like spur people on in this grand sort of you know do something good kind of you know thing um <clears throat> now it's uh there we go. Originally, the film was projected to gross only 11 to $15 million over its first week of release, with some estimates even reaching $20 million. The film ended up grossing $14.2 million on its first day, 3.6 on its second, and 3.5 on its third, for a Tuesday through Thursday total of $21.3 million. And it went on to make 18.2 in its opening weekend, finishing third at the box office. And currently it still sits at 25th place among the highest grossing films of 2023 in the United States, which isn't bad for a small little, uh, you know, crowdfunded, uh, you know, basic uh, marketing campaign. Now also released the same day was the fifth installment of the Indiana Jones series, which took home 24 million bucks on its opening day and 60 million over the three day weekend. But due to its massive budget is still considered to be a box office bomb, which I will never understand that. Indiana Jones is considered a tank, a bomb, because it, it just costs so much money, it hasn't recouped it all yet. And that, maybe that's with The Little Mermaid, too. I mean, those movies are very expensive to make, you know? And on the opening day, much was made in the press of The Sound of Freedom taking number one at the box office against Indiana Jones, but those numbers were premature and due in large part to the marketing campaign for the advanced ticket sale. So you had $10,000 or $10 million off rip contributing to the seemingly, you know, large opening day number, but it wasn't really that. The 10 million was already sold months in advance, so it only really made 14. So a lot of articles were saying, Indiana Jones was toppled by this little film, Sound of Freedom, but it's not, it wasn't really the case, right? It's a little convoluted. So right off the bat, headlines and articles claiming that the Sound of Freedom movie overtook Indy 5 was just not really kind of true if you actually look at the box office tape. But what I wanted to get into Briefly, and I well, air even quote, said it brief. made sixty million the second day, right? Yeah, um, over I think overall over the weekend or something like that. Yeah, so that's obviously quite. It's just not earning back. It's it cost a lot, but it's not earning back. It's it's not earning back yet, right? Yeah. Um, but I want to get into air quote briefly what the Sound of Freedom is about because rarely does a film based on so little claim to have such a big impact on the world, and you know again generalizing this it's sort of disney adjacent because it was once owned by disney but now it's not and so i'm just going to talk about it because i enjoy this yeah i was wondering like where the disney comes in or if we'd (laughs) already abandoned that portion oh yeah it's based sort of abandoned but uh anyway the plot to the film is is basic jim caviezel who played uh you know christ in the passion of the christ of course uh, plays Tim Ballard, a former government agent who embarks on a mission to rescue children from sex traffickers in Colombia. A pretty standard Hollywood fare, because if it's anything pretty much everyone can agree on, it's that child trafficking is bad and we are all against it. So you have movies that are basically the same plot, Taken with Liam Neeson. His daughter was taken to be you know, trafficked. Uh, Rambo, Last Blood, same thing. Like this is just a thing. <laughs> Rambo. The trope. Rambo, man. Yeah. I haven't seen, I've not seen Taken, I, and I also have not seen Rambo, what, four? Oh, God. I don't Rambo know. I seven? want to say like five, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Taken was good. Um, if you like Taken, there's Taken two. <laughs> this is basically the same thing. Okay. Um, but it's, you know, it's that whole like child trafficking, you know, trope. Like, I don't want to call it a trope because it actually happens, but not the way, not the way it does in those movies. Um, However, for years now, there have been rumors and accusations surrounding Tim Ballard and his organization, which the uh, movie is based on. The op- organization is called Operation Underground Railroad, or OUR, mainly that the claims made by Ballard and his team are exaggerated at best and outright false at worst. His backstory is that he used to work for the CIA, busting child, rings, uh, child porn rings online, while rewarding... This was increasingly frustrating for Ballard, and he longed to do something more to help these children that were being exploited. Very va- valuable, heroic work. While on an operation in Colombia in 2014, he quit his job after being told to come home just so he could finish his task and save these kids he had been tracking for months. 
very, you know, very noble thing. This is actually a thing that man did. And, you know, good job for him. Later, he founded OUR and went around the world rescuing trafficked children and adults, sort of. I'll read from a Vice article that, in an unusual turn of events, did some really great reporting on Ballard over the last couple of years, uncovering many discrepancies and falsehoods. Quote, as Vice News has previously reported, a number of OUR's claims about its work are dramatically overstated or without clear documentary evidence. People who have volunteered for OUR have raised concerns that it could actually have been creating demand for trafficking victims by going to foreign countries undercover missions that at times have seemed to consist of walking around bars and sex club asking for underage girls. The organization's support for law enforcement has at times been wildly exaggerated and involved OUR taking credit for agencies' operations after making relatively trivial donations and its much-touted aftercare program for survivors that it did end up rescuing has at times involved things like placing women with unqualified providers and even fabricating college graduation ceremonies. <laughs> in another story uncovered by Vice, OUR heavily marketed its role in the rescue of Liliana, a young trafficking survivor, with Ballard telling a fanciful story about this rescue in congressional testimony and in media appearances in which he called for a border wall. She, in fact, rescued herself and did not meet OUR representatives until years after she had done so when she was preparing to testify against her traffickers in court. And in a more minor and weirder incident, Ballard recently claimed that OUR was collaborating with American Airlines, which was also not true. The organization just had bought ads with a third-party ad service that airs programming on some American Airlines flights. It's just it's literally just making things up. These incidents and many others added up to a pattern of misrepresentation and exaggeration that even some OUR operators told Vice that they found disturbing and misleading. Now, of course, child trafficking is a very real and extremely serious problem, in part because it's so difficult to track. Reliable statistics are hard to come by due to the underreported nature of the phenomenon, but the U.S. State Department has reported that 600 to 800,000 people are trafficked across international borders per year, with about 50% of these cases being children. Yet from the movie's opening montage, which so shows 300,000 children are being trafficked a, a year. Yeah. Um, but what they and I don't know if I mention it, but what what they don't understand, what they can't do is determine why. You know what I mean? It's either uh, it's not necessarily for criminal reasons. You know, it could be um, I, I God, you know, we have like Amber Alert in California where it's like a, a, a kidnapped child, a big wide you know, alert goes off. I think they've been doing it for years and they've never used it to catch anybody because many of the uh, missing children reports are uh, like 80 percent are just runaway kids that come home the next day. You know what I mean? Like it's not it's, so the the number is big of reports are, is is big, but with with trafficking, they don't really know what is um, uh, consensual trafficking is what they call it, where it's like you're underage but you want to go with this person to help you get somewhere else, stuff like that. But anyways, mm. yes, I they mean say even if eighty percent of three hundred thousand is illegitimate, that's still like sixty thousand children. It's, it's being a lot. Yeah. A year. <clears throat> Definitely not saying, uh, you know, otherwise. Uh, from the movie's opening montage, which shows surveillance footage of children being snatched by strangers off the streets, Sound of Freedom offers a, quote, false perception of how the majority of child trafficking actually takes place. Contrary to urban legends about kids getting abducted in Target parking lots by strangers or anonymous figures snatching children from alleyways, the majority of child trafficking victims know and trust their traffickers explains Teresa Huzar, CEO of the National Children's Alliance. And indeed, a large body of research shows that many child trafficking victims are LGBTQ or gender non-conforming youth who have been kicked out of their homes and forced into sex trade by someone close to them. While Sound of Freedom almost exclusively focuses on very young children, the majority of traffic ch uh, ch child trafficking victims are adolescents or teenagers. Uh, majority, right, are uh, apparently, 67% apparently are between the ages of 15 and 17. By, and so well, what's the point, right? Because uh, a child is still a child, and that's absolutely true. But ignoring the realities of what victims and traffickers look like, and then overall using a sensational movie like this, um, 
it, there's it, it the larger structural issues that prevent at risk children from getting help like widely available government funded substance abuse treatment programs for families struggling with a, addiction quote they are likely to be trafficked again unless you address that underlying issue and what made them vulnerable in the first place. Some of the larger inaccuracies in films like Sound of Freedom are also harmful in that they perpetuate false ideas about trafficking that can have material consequences for victims. And I'm still reading from a Vice article. It says um, it creates harm when certain policies aren't passed because we think trafficking looks one way as it does in Sound of Freedom, and it's not. It's a completely different way. It creates harm when victims don't recognize themselves in these narratives. <clears throat> And honestly, I'm getting a little loose with what I wrote because uh, it's a weird subject, man. I don't necessarily like talking about it, but I, I don't know why I think it's really important. To yeah, talk on our about. Disney newscast. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's weird, but I but you know what? And it's like if this movie wasn't getting so much recognition in the press for beating Indiana Jones five and that's. Uh, you know what I mean? It's I wouldn't I wouldn't even feel compelled to talk about it, but clearly people are going and seeing it. And I guess I just want to let people know that it's that this movie is based on literally a fabricate nothing. Nothing. The one thing in this movie is is correct. Everything is just blown out of proportion to feed this guy's ego and, and line his pockets. And it's sad. And I don't know. It just speaks to me. So that's why I put this at the end. Mm. If you don't want to read, there's nothing. There's no more Disney stuff. So if you don't want to listen to the rest of the show, I don't blame you. Oh, there's I really more. don't. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> you want to skip through some stuff? Is it boring? Well, it's a true it's story, dumb? right? Because he was he was a federal agent. You he, said CIA, but I I understood that he worked for the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I think there was. Uh, I mean, he was a former CIA, but he did work for Homeland. I think later okay. on. Um, it's a true story in that he worked for Homeland Security. Uh, but you know, I won't even read it. I'll just we can just <laughs> converse about it. It's fine. Um. OK, but the, the story in the movie is it opens with like him saving a little boy. Did you go at, see it? No, hell no. Oh. No, 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 no. Um, but it opens with him like saving a little boy and he's in the boys like, can you find my sister? Here's a necklace. And she gave it to me when I was, you know, whatever. And uh, he goes off and does the, the movie. Right. But apparently like he was never at, like that happened. That was real. There was a, a, a child at the border. And he's talked about it for years. Like this was his this was his triggering moment, his hero mm -hmm. moment about why he wanted to start, you know, doing this. Because in, in before that, he was just, you know, collecting evidence and going online and you know, getting data and and you know, evidence. Right. Okay. I'm dancing around what he was doing, but anyways. Um. So apparently, what really happened, and and it's like he 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 would never release the the guy's name who who had this child but he was he repeatedly would say this five-year-old boy was being trafficked and he would be taken uh, across the border from california to mexico every weekend for these activities and he was trafficked and he was being trafficked and uh anyway he finally like mentioned this dude's name and reporters just went online and googled it Turns out none of what he said was true. The, this this little boy actually existed, but he was on a trip with his uncle, I think, or something like that. Like his grandma knew where he was. Mm. The boy was not being trafficked. He unfortunately was being abused. And so the border patrol found that information. 45 minutes later, Ballard comes in just to collect the evidence. So he wasn't there at the stop. The, the kid was not being sold, you know, for whatever. It, it was just it was a complete fabrication and and a, and and a story that he's been changing ever since ever since he began giving interviews it's like every once in a while he either forgets the facts or embellishes them um and so in fact like his first raid that he was doing with OUR he had television cameras there because he wanted to pitch it as a TV show so the whole thing has always been sort of like to get this multimedia you know kind of arm going which never took off and so the whole thing um and I guess really that's that's what I wanted to talk about, because at the core, uh, Sound of Freedom is a movie loosely based on real events, but masking a real problem in the world. And what he's doing is using these events to market themselves as something that they are not, which is heroes. They're really not. There's all sorts of stories. If you look into it, even remotely, they are literally fabricating lines about 
uh, missions that they're involved in. They said, oh, yeah, we did this and we did this. And reporters go and like talk to the agencies that that ran these raids and they go, who? Never heard of these people. They were never part of it. But mm-hmm. they tell these stories at fundraising events for for, you know, conservative uh, religious groups for their own charities. And they raise one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars a pop off of them. But they're not actually true. The hard part is they're all around the world, so it's hard to really pin anything down. And he gives just a lot of like, it's like he's describing an action movie, no names, no locations, but nobody's able to really pin any of these people down that he's actually, you know, saved or rescued. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he also conflates like who is being trafficked and forced into this kind of work and who's doing it consensually, like in Thailand and stuff like that. And you can assume what I'm talking about. There's also no aftercare. So he'll remove these people and then give them to the government and go, okay, we did our job. And the government goes, I, we, we don't have the resources. And then they, they just, they go back to the streets. So it's in the, he's not really doing anything, but the cameras pick up that and he did a thing and he can go and sell this story and he can go and pitch this. And he's making money off of the suffering of, uh, literally the suffering of children. And it's sad and it sucks. And so I don't want anybody to see the movie because it's just a pile of, I mean, by all accounts, it's a fine movie. It's fine. It, it, it's Jim Caviezel. If you like that corner, sort of sleepy, cry guy, emo guy vibe. Um, but it, it's not anyway. Um, <clears throat> I don't know him as an actor. Uh, I've heard the name, but I don't really know. Yeah. I, he was mm-hmm. recently in a, um, a TV series that Tara and I were watching, and he's just kind of objectively pretty terrible. Person of Interest was one, and okay. I was listening to this podcast where they, they did a bunch of research and they talked to a bunch of people who worked on the set of that show, and he was, like, awful to work with, horrible to work with. And I mentioned in here to the point where he couldn't remember his lines, and he, uh, he would literally tape cue cards on the foreheads of his you know the people in the scene when they were doing like the reverse shot if it's just him over the shoulder would have a cue card and like this person was like and i'm not even exaggerating the word no is written on a card taped to a person's forehead so he can remember to say the word no in this scene I re- it makes me think of, no, this is totally not related. Well, it's related in that sense. But if you watch the Golden Girls in the later seasons, yeah, you can totally see. B. Arthur, it's like a Saturday Night Live sketch. You know where they're just obviously off to the side? <laughs> <laughs> like some of B. Arthur's monologues, she's so clearly like looking off at a, you're, and I didn't notice it until someone pointed it at my friend pointed it out to me. She's like, Did you ever notice that? And I said, no. And then I watched it. I thought, oh my God, it really is. Uh, she's really doing that. And I have to wonder how much that goes on where like people are reading cue cards. But oh yeah, yeah for sure. I, mean, I guess she's probably an old lady. She could be forgiven for some of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think oh, it's yeah. just the the nature of of doing, you know, a live TV show like that. I think it happens. I think yeah. I think those people like Seinfeld, I think it's is big. And sometimes if you look and you can if you notice that kind of stuff, you pick up on it, but you don't know that you're picking up on it. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, okay, that's probably what it is, but you're not, you know, focused on yeah. it too much, I guess. Um yeah, anyway. So, well, um, I suppose if there's a silver lining, it's a raise awareness to a problem. But like you said, well, uh yeah. you have like I mean, obviously, there's trafficking. I mean, Jeffrey Go- uh, Jeffrey Epstein, right? We know that this happened, and it, but the hit what you described, the like sort of teens, is like that 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 what's her Guthrie Guthrie girl who uh, uh, made allegations against um, Prince Andrew and the photographs of her when she's like oh yeah, yeah yeah with the with the prince and yeah you know obviously Jelaine Maxwell's in prison and she's not there because of uh tax evasion <laughs> so uh clearly maybe it's happening under a different set of circumstances sometimes yeah it it is it is happening but uh, a lot of you know trafficking experts are coming out and speaking out against this movie saying that it it develops an unreal sense of what the problem is and so people think that, oh, they can donate it or they just go save the children. Mm. And that's enough. Be- but it's not really. And what, and I was reading a couple of their articles about it. And uh, they were like, there's actually been cases where 
um, testimony against a, a, a pimp in this one article I was reading. Um, the pimp was, uh, there were two people bringing charges and he was only accused of one because that, the, the testimony against that guy was sort of more Hollywood-esque than this other real case of like, you know, sort of gaslighting, stringing along, getting this person hooked on drugs and whatever. And that wasn't enough for the jury because they didn't really think that it was a trafficked issue because they're, it's not like in, it's not like in Taken. You know what I mean? So the problem I think with, with this is like, if it's a real story, show the real story. You don't need to church it up. Mm -hmm. But the problem is like, and so for example, this guy, you know, Tim Ballard, he says back to the beginning of the movie where like, oh, this kid gave me a necklace and it was his sister's find my sister that like it, by all accounts didn't really happen. He just made it up. And, but he's been selling it online since like 2014, like a replica of this necklace that his kid gave. But oh, the necklace. yeah, but, but then the story is convoluted because it's like, Oh, my sister gave it to me. I'm five years old, but I was also taken as an infant. Well, then when did your sister give you this necklace and how did you know it? You know mm. what I mean? It's like these kinds of things that are like, what are you even talking about? But right. the part I really want to talk about is why would someone like Jim Caviezel want to be part of this murky project? Well, for one, he's very religious and has already been in the world of online conspiracy thinking, which might have made him an easy mark for Ballard. Like the more I read about this organization and, and Jim Caviezel, the more I think Jim Caviezel is being trafficked. I think we need a wellness check on him <laughs> because I because when Ballard was writing the script, he was like, I want the guy who played Jesus to be to play me. He didn't know the man's name. He's like, but the guy who played Passion of the Christ, Christ guy, I want him to play me. And I think he went out and just and got him. And it, Jim Caviezel sort of mush brained right now. Um, Caviezel mentioned the bizarrely popular adrenochrome conspiracy theory at an online conference in 2021, I think, which is. Uh, that the elite cabal, uh, you know, extract a substance called adrenochrome from uh, scared children, which can, uh, you know, which then keeps them young and, you know, whatever. Uh, never mind that you can literally just buy the chemical adrenochrome online and it does nothing for you. Um, and it's directly connected with fear and loathing in Las Vegas for spreading that, like, you know, when he was pure adrenochrome, man, it's not a, it's not a thing that people, whatever. Anyway, that's a very much a QAnon you know, thing. Uh, he says they're pulling children out of the darkest recesses of hell, all kinds of places, the adrenochroming of children. Caviezel claims Ballard was the one who told them about this very not real thing, and it brought tears to his eyes when he was hearing the story of the thing that literally does not happen. Perhaps related to his gullibility, Caviezel had also been struck by lightning no less than four times in his life. What? Yeah. It's like document, like he's been literally struck by lightning. Uh, maybe four times is what, exaggerating. What is he, Ben Franklin? But at least, at least twice, if not three times. What, what is this, the great outdoors? <laughs> uh, what is this, the cover of National Lampoon's Christmas? No. Um, has an almost impossible time rem remembering his lines on set and spends his downtime backstage reading passages of the Bible to literally anyone within earshot for and like follows them around catering reading passages of the bible to them he's not well like this man is not i don't think he's very well um <clears throat> anyway and then like ballard went online to support do you remember that thing i think it was back in 2020 maybe 21 where um the popular online site wayfair was being accused of being a portal to buy trafficked children through I don't remember that. You don't remember that? Oh, my God. I guess that's the things that I read. Um, so Ballard was like, oh, yeah, that's definitely how they do it. Like, he was like, yeah, that's how they do it. So you go online, and because there's, like, an armchair worth, you know, $5,000 called the Athena. And it's like, but in the Midwest, there was a child missing with the same name. So you could buy, you know, and so they're just saying that, like, that that's their code. You go on Wayfair and buy. It's insane. It's insane stuff, but um, yeah, whatever. Uh, obviously, human track, we're winding up. Okay, um, good, because it's like 20 after 11 here. I know, I know, we're, I know. I'm in overtime <clears throat> over here. I'll pay you overtime, don't worry. Double, double what you uh, make. <laughs> um, when I read about the special appearance <clears throat> by Jim Caviezel at the end of the film, as the credits play, Jim Caviezel reappears to say how the makers of Sound of Freedom believe this movie could be the Uncle Tom's Cabin for the 21st century slavery. 
He said that children shown in the movie are real, but spend most of the time trying to empower you, the people, to spread the word, scan the QR code, and buy more tickets so other people can see this movie and put an end to this horror. But it is very unclear as to actually how that would happen. Um, anyway, um, blah, 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 blah. If you made it this far wondering how this applies to Disney news, it doesn't. Aside from the fact that Disney could have saved us all from this demonstrably false garbage of a movie, much like the Hot Cheetos film, the term fake it till you make it definitely applies here. That's it. I'm closing my computer. I had <laughs> okay. a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun reading about it and writing about it. And uh, I don't know, man. It's one of those things where as I'm going back and editing this, I'm going to hate Mother Choice for doing this, but I don't care. I think it was uh, important to make people aware that if they go and see this movie, none of it is real. And it's literally just a way for this man to raise money. He also has given himself a raise over the last year, uh, despite um, donations falling like 30% to his company. Like, it's just a grift, man. It's just another grift. But he made a movie, so good for him, I guess. Okay. Well, I think the thing that's interesting is that... <sighs> what? Uh, Oh, oh! Uh, now I want to say something. And no, 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 no! I'm just, I'm just. I've been listening to you. Read no, I'm just saying. Day. So, uh, my point you're is, you're turd. Yeah, that uh, indie has yes. performed very poorly and isn't making back its costs. I suppose it's another one in a long stream. I mean, this keeps happening to Disney. But you look, yes. look at Mission Impossible. It's about oh to make its best of the entire Mission Impossible, all of the installments. This is going to be the biggest one. You know what I saw? So, you know, we talk about like, oh, people are sick of the old story. And about... There seems to be studios and Tom Cruise seems to be the one who can pull, put, <laughs> put butts in the seats because what's the other one he did? Top Gun. He, These he can. He, oh, yeah. He can, he can get people into a movie theater. Maybe we need a, to a Tom <clears throat> Cruise Disney movie. Tom Cruise is a lunatic all on himself with the Scientology nonsense. He's, he is, he is, he's insane. He's peculiar. He, that man, that man literally thinks he's a reincarnation of a space alien. Like, I don't really, you know, whatever. Um, he does, but he is a fantastic actor. He's a good actor. And I think, I think the draw more than anything is that he does most like 80% of his own stunts. There's this in the trailer. He's on a motorcycle flying off into the air and then so, i saw the behind the scenes it's him doing it it's him doing it. i mean he was obviously you know on wires and he was protected like he wasn't gonna you know he could have seriously injured himself but he wasn't freestyling he, it off a bike you know what i mean he was he was definitely attached to wires no, but he had a shoe i think yeah but i think he also had uh, anyway i think he had wires too let's just pretend i'm it, right whatever um, i watched <laughs> i was like guess whatever yeah. i watched i was like guess what i'm not doing it yeah, I don't know. Uh, I read that uh, he did that stunt on the first day to like show the crew, like we're gonna do this. Like that was wow. his first. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, those store, those are the stories that people I think want to, you know, want to see. But I'm also getting tired of this Tom Cruise guy, honestly. Um, <laughs> the budget oh. for the final Indiana Jones movie was three hundred million dollars. So of course you're not That's gonna make nice. that back on its opening weekend. I mean, get over yourself. Yeah, but it, that means it has to make like a billion in order to break even. Is that how that works? Well, because they don't get 100% of the profits. Well, I guess. Like yeah. the movie theater takes its cut. So they have to, they don't just, it's not just like, you know, I think that it's the worldwide movie theater is there. So you have to more than double your budget in order to even turn a profit. I see your I see your point. As of July 5th, the total worldwide gross, uh, so it's July 12th right now. As of July 5th, the total worldwide gross is at 159 million. So, you know, I don't know what that is now, you know, six days later, but um, yeah. Oh, actually we can see right now. Indiana Jones, and the Dial of Destiny. Yeah, 120 million, oh, I don't know what's going on. Lifetime growth. So this isn't brand new. 
I don't know, well, man. There's it's, something I, else going on. I mean, it, I agree. It, maybe it will make its money back, but clearly there are movies that are able to perform. And the question is, why is Disney not able to be the ones who make any of them? <laughs> well, so here, here's what, and we were talking about this in, in the Discord the other day, is my theory on these is that people aren't going to the movie theaters on purpose, not because they don't want to see the movies, because they know they're going to be on Disney Plus in a month or two months or whatever. They don't want to go to the movies for whatever reason. Either it's expensive or, like me, you just don't enjoy going to the movies or you don't want to get COVID. You know what I mean? I just, I, I don't want to, I don't, I've never really liked the movie theater. I haven't seen him. I think the last movie I saw in the theaters was uh, Last Jedi. And it's like, whatever, dude, this, everything's so friggin' expensive. It's probably, it's the same reason why people aren't going to the parks. But I wonder if that's it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, if, if these people who state, what am I trying to say? If people who want to see the movie, like me, I'll, I'll see the Indiana Jones movie. I know it's going to come on Disney Plus, so I'm not really too worried about not seeing it, not catching it in the theaters. If there was more of a buffer between a release, I think more people would see it. So I think the box office, and I think that's the problem Disney has moving forward with the streaming thing, is you're going to take, it's going to, of course, it's going to take a bite out of your box office revenue. Of course it's going to, because in the past, that was the only place people could watch this content. Now, you just wait four or five weeks and it's streaming. So you got it already. Always, it was, You're already yeah, paying for it. We've always had DVDs. Before Disney Plus, we had Blockbuster. Yeah, but DVD, thing. You were always DVDs, going to be able to see it. But DVDs would come out six months, a year down the road. And then Not eventually. Yeah, for sure. And then, a ye- and then eventually, before the streaming wars sort of really took off, you know, it's a month or two months, and so they caught up to that. They 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 would lower or they would reduce the 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 buffer time between release of the DVD and you know and movie theater because they don't want to take a bite out of the out of the out of the Johns. I don't know. That's my well, that's my Girthworm, thought on it. Girthworm is in the chat, and Girthworm liked indie. So a a, a four a five star review from Girth. Nice. I appreciate that. I was talking to announcer man Charlie and he was like, oh, yeah, I thought it was great. It was an Indiana Jones movie and it was it was the Indiana Jones movie. I said, that's great. And I also said, I've heard that Indiana four was terrible. And he goes, it's an Indiana Jones movie. If you go into it thinking it's a campy Indiana Jones movie. Then that's what you're going to get out of it. I was like, man, you're too positive. I swear to God. Now I have to see (laughs) Indiana Jones four. But I haven't seen Indiana Jones one, two or three. Oh my God, they're great movies. The The second one is not so good. There's good parts to it, but you wouldn't like it. Um, Indiana Jones 3 was great. You should watch Indy 1. Just do it. It's good. It's, it's, it's good. It's good. We're done. We get out of here now? Look, guys, I'm sorry. All right, I didn't... <laughs> Amanda for- in the chat is very appreciative of your information. I like Amanda. Uh, she, I'm always happy when she comes in the um, in the chat, specifically because she compliments me. Yeah, and she brings she good insider that. info in well, the that's earlier part why. of the chat too. So I really do appreciate Amanda. Look, everybody in the chat rules. I appreciate it. But yeah, I don't know. Thanks for indulging me. Uh, you know, it's it's a thing I had to get off my chest. So uh, what are you gonna do? Anyway, um, what do we got going on? I don't know what we got going on. We're we're done. We're out of here. But uh, thanks very much for supporting the show. And uh, until next time, we'll see you later.